Do me a favor, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Exodus. And if you don't have a Bible, let's take a quick second, and you can um, wander back by where Dean is back there, and he will go ahead and hand you one. Um, I love it. Go ahead and stand up and walk back there if you need to, because I think there is great importance in us turning pages together and, and getting our nose right in there. If you don't have a Bible, you can go ahead and take, take one of those home with you. Uh, if you were here last week, we, we went through a lengthy uh, discussion or explanation of something called Right Now Media. And, and what this is, if you weren't here last Sunday, I'm going to give you the very quick summarized version. Uh, what it is, is it's an online Bible study opportunity. It's basically, it's just like Netflix, only it's Bible studies. Uh, and, and the entire church uh, has the opportunity to log into it and be a part of it. And so I want to invite all of you to do that. It's very simple. All you need to do is in the lobby, uh, there's a sheet on the table. Put your email and your name on it, and then you will receive an email invitation to, to be a part of it. It's very easy to follow. Again, it's called Right Now Media, so if you put your email down and you receive an email from them, uh, make sure you click on it and follow the instructions. And it's a very cool thing. It's going to be an opportunity for me to put stuff on there. We have a specific Maranatha CLC page in the library column. So I'll be able to put stuff on there, maybe that we're doing in the youth, something that I watch that is just good stuff, something that's going on on Wednesdays here, and at any time you guys can log into it and, and then just go ahead and take part in it. So I'm not going to go into any more detail on it, but if you have questions, please don't be afraid to ask one of us, myself, Dennis, Denise, Tasha, Phil, we're all pretty familiar with it. Um, so again, uh, it's just a great tool, you guys, for us as a church. So I want to encourage you to fill that out. If you did sign it up last week and you have not received an email yet, um, talk to Tasha because she sent out all of the requests. So if you haven't seen that yet, go ahead and ask Tasha about it. All right, moving on. Exodus. We're back in Exodus again. You guys, I've really had a great time talking about Moses. Like It seems like for months now, but it's been four messages worth. But I, I just have loved it. And that's why this morning, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to review briefly the last three messages having to do with Moses. I think repetition is good. In the church, all too often, we preach a message and just move on, and then the next message, and then the next message. Uh, but what do we actually do with a lot of the stuff that we talk about? And so I'm all about reviewing and repeating things. So I'm going to do that. My first three points are going to be reviewing some of the messages, and then our, my fourth one is going to be something new for us for today. So to begin with, the first thing, when we look at this idea of Moses and what we've learned from just watching uh, his kind of journey is, um, is listening when God wants to get your attention. Listening when God wants to get your attention. Turn to Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Where we are in the story is uh, Moses was raised in Egypt. Uh, he murdered the Egyptian, was kind of found out, and took off. He was about 40 years old then. For 40 years, he was hanging out in the wilderness, became this uh, shepherd. He's just managing his father-in-law's flock. And this is where we find him now, about 40 years later, when God presents himself to him in the burning bush. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire, from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. So here's Moses. Moses is going along in his everyday life, and he sees this thing. What he sees is a way that God is trying to get his attention. God's saying, hey, over here. So he does something. So Moses says, I'm going to go over there. Now verse 4, this is very important. It says this, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And that was the thing we talked about that day. What do we do in the busyness and chaos of our everyday life to stop and listen when God is trying to get our attention? When God is trying to pull us in a direction? When God is trying to just say, hey, just stop for a second. Do we? Do we actually stop? This is, when I read this, that, that just leapt off the page to me. Everything changed because God's over here in the bush. Understand this. God is God. Angie, God could have at any time said, Moses! He could have, he could have done anything. 
to get his attention. He decides to appear in a bush, a burning bush. What if Moses would have meandered through, said, oh, that's cool. I'm busy. i got to keep going. Because if I'm honest, you guys, that's what I think our lives are filled with. Our lives are filled with these burning bush type of experience. Maybe not to that level of strangeness. But I think God is trying to get our attention at, at a lot of times. I think he's trying to speak to us. I think he wants to encourage us or maybe challenge us or call us. Give us hope. And I think all too often because of the chaos of our lives, oh, yeah, okay, and then we just say we got to go. I think of all ages and how busy we are. Parents of young children, man, it's crazy running all over. Grandparents, they're doing one thing or another. Retired people, uh, I know four retired people, and they never sit still. My parents and Melanie's parents, they never sit still. They're always doing something, which is great. Young people today, man, I think of, of children. Uh, we have a friend, and they just signed their five-year-old up for mites, for hockey. And I said, that's it, your life is over. <laughs> it's done. You have no, there's nothing. We're never going to see you. And, and it, it's not even like the lakes aren't frozen and they're playing hockey. You guys, we get so busy. How many times do we miss God trying to get our attention to tell us something? That was the first thing we learned from Moses' experience there. Now, what do we do when God wants to get our attention? Pause. Stop. And see what he's trying to say. The second thing we learned or we talked about was in Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. This idea of using what God has put in your hands. So God and Moses are having this interaction. And in, in, in chapter 4, verse 1, Moses is just kind of questioning, you know, what's, what's going to happen? How are they going to respond to me? Moses answered, well, what if they do not believe me or listen to me? And they say, well, the Lord did not appear to you. You know how often you get that, all this doubt and all of this, nah, that didn't happen to you. He wouldn't use you. He couldn't do this. And then the Lord said to him, well, well, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, well, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. I'd have put all the 12-gauge and shot the dang thing. That would have been it. Can't stand snakes. If anybody comes in my office like that video with a snake, I'm out my window so fast. You're on your own with that snake. God says to Moses, what's that in your hand? Moses is questioning the ability. God, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? And God says, well, what's that in your hand? What do you have with you? God didn't say, well, Moses, if only you had this. If only you had that. What God says is, what do you have in your hand? And we use that as a great challenge for those of us in the church to stop feeling like or thinking we have to be somebody else in order to be used by God. If only I was as talented as Brent. If only I could do what Rodney could do. If only I was Jason. Well, well, it's a thought. I mean, his effort. But that's too many of our mentalities. We see other people and the great things other people can do, and we look at ourselves as though we can't do anything. And this encouragement from God talking to Moses, and he says, well, what's in your hand? He doesn't say it's too bad you're not wearing armor. He doesn't say it's too bad you can't use a slingshot like David. He doesn't say it's too bad you can't do this. It's too bad you can't do that. He says, what's that in your hand? Let's use what's in your hand. We talked about how uncomfortable it is when we try and be somebody else. David going off to fight Goliath, putting on Saul's armor. It doesn't fit. It doesn't work. So David throws it off, picks up what he's familiar with. He uses what's in his hand, what's worked for him in the past. The slingshot, the smooth stones, and the staff. And you put that together with what God can do, and anything's possible. My favorite picture, and some of you that were here for this message, you remember this. My favorite picture is is in Matthew 14, where the crowd had followed Jesus. He just learned of John the Baptist's beheading. The crowd follows Jesus, and they get out there, and Jesus says, or, or the disciples say, it's late, you guys got to go and, and eat. And Jesus says, well, hold on a second. You feed them. They don't have to go anywhere. You feed them. And now their response is just like that of many of ours. But this is all I have to give. All we have is five loaves and two fishes. I don't have much to offer. This is all I have to offer. 
And God says, perfect. Larry, if you bring, even though you think you don't have much, if you bring what you do have, if you bring what you do have, I'll take it. And we'll do something amazing with it. You see, I think that's the most important part, and that's the part that we miss. Is what do you have to bring? Are you willing to bring it? Not how much do you have, not how good is it, but are you willing to bring it? Even if it's only five loaves and two fishes, take that and you combine it with what God has, and anything's possible. Getting used to and comfortable with using what's in your hands. The third thing that we talked about, and this was last week, and, and this one for me, this was, this was kind of challenging because it really focuses on, on how we look at and only see our inadequacies. Remember, Moses, Moses has this speech problem. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 4, verses, verse 10. Verse 10 through 13. This is good to be warm in here, a little uncomfortable, you know that? We're always so comfortable, aren't we? Let's be honest, I am miserable right now, I'm so hot. Are you guys hot? Yeah, no? That's why it's so hard to keep you guys happy, because one of you is hot and one of you is freezing. Got menopause going here and you got this going here. Chapter 4, verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, and, and Moses, again, he's just he's arguing with the Lord and pleading, God, there's got to be a different way. There's got to be somebody else. Moses said to the Lord, Oh, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I, I'm slow of speech and tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. God's saying, Moses, stop worrying about that. Don't think about what you can't do. Who put it there? Who created everything? I did it. I'm going to help you. Let's move on. And Moses still, he's like, but Moses said, Lord, please send somebody else. And, and last week, and again, it, it kind of challenged me, put, put a lump in my throat, um, just thinking of this, because this idea that Moses is, is, is not eloquent of speech, it's very believed that he had something like a stutter of some kind. And we, we talked about this last week. So imagine this now. Again, his problem or weakness is speaking to people. God didn't ask him to go build a pyramid. God didn't ask him to bring his flock there. Shepherd, keep shepherding. It's what you're good at. Keep shepherding. God asks the guy with the speech problem to go and talk to Pharaoh. And he didn't ask them, ask them, at them. He didn't ask them to go. <laughs> I'm tired. Things are getting tangled. He didn't ask him to go to his neighbor. He didn't ask him to go to the guy working at the bread shop. He asked him to go to Pharaoh, the king, the leader, the guy who, like that, can make and do whatever he wants. And God says, I want you to go talk to him. Now Moses is freaking out. I mean, you can tell because he keeps going back to this. But God, I still can't. Even after talking with you, I still can't. And this anxiety that's coming up in him, and, and, and this picture that's in my head is Moses, he's saying this with that stutter. God says, you're going to do this. And Moses is going, but please. Don't send me. That's real life, you guys. We read it, it's just words on a paper. Can you feel the pain of that guy? The struggle, what he's going through? Just this whole idea of, I'm asking you, even though you can't talk very well, I'm asking you to go talk to him. got to be somebody else. God says, don't focus on that. Friends, we focus so much on our inadequacies. We get so caught up in the things that we can't do that like Moses did. Stay with me here. Moses lost sight of what he can do. 
and was only focused on himself. He lost sight of what God can do. He lost sight of, of who he is and was focused only on his, his own abilities. You guys, there's too many of us that do that. That God is trying to stop by using a painted palette to get your attention. He's trying to catch you with a burning bush. He's trying to use the homeless guy. He's trying to talk to you through your spouse or your kids or a close friend. The word, he's trying to get your attention. And he's trying to say, Maggie, you can do this. Ashley, you got this. He's trying to say this to you. And if we choose to stop and listen, and, and if we want to hear what he's doing, then we get distracted because we're focused on how we can't do that. You know, the Bible says God is made strong in our weaknesses. That's amazing. Friends, we have to, we have to change that. That was the third thing. So the first week we talked about listening when God wants to get our attention. The second we talked about using what, uh, what we have in our hand. The third, this desire that we have for God to pick someone else, our focus on our own inadequacies instead of his. The fourth, what we're going to talk about today briefly, is this. Sometimes it's just too much. Sometimes it's just too much. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 6. Where we are here now, Moses and Aaron have gone, they've gone to Egypt They've really stirred up a hornet's nest for the Israelites. I mean, they, they went in and, and they made some people mad and, and they made their lives worse. Uh, now they have to continue. They have to continue with their quota of the brick making, but they have to supply all their own resources, all their own materials. None of them are being brought to them. So they have to now work that much harder as slaves in Egypt, that much harder to achieve the same things. And this is all stirred up because Moses and Aaron came to town. So that's kind of where we find ourselves here uh, in Exodus chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Uh, it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. And I want you to listen closely to all of the things that God is saying is going to take place. All of the things that he's encouraging them with. Uh, because of his mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan when they lived as aliens. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. So now God is saying to Moses, this is what I want you to say to them. Therefore... Say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. Listen to the confidence and the authority and, and what, what he's having Moses bring to present to the Israelites. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. This is all of the stuff that God is saying through Moses. Here is what you're going to get. Now listen to how they respond. Moses reported this to the Israelites. But they did, they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and their cruel bondage. Moses brings this message. You guys listen to this. He brings this message of, here's what we're going to do. This is the direction that we're going. Here's what you're going to experience. This is the, the authority and the positivity and the energy. And this is what's out there. This is what it could be. And this is what it's going to be. And Dave, here's what I'm going to give to you. And, and he's just... I, I feel this authority and this, this drive of here's what it's going to be. It's going to be awesome. You're not going to drive a Chevette anymore. You're getting a Corvette. It's not an S10. It's an F350. I mean, this is the picture that he's painting for them. But because of the life that they're in, their response is so often the same as ours. 
They don't even listen to them because of their discouragement and because of their current situation. They don't even listen to them. So they have this great picture painted for them of what it's going to be. And they don't even listen to them because of their current situation. You guys, I want to ask you a question. How many of us, and don't, don't answer with nods or hands or anything, but I'm challenged to think how many of us in a time of worship like we had, how many of us, there was a burning bush type of a thing that went on? How many of us, when Denise had us close her eyes and just sing, you are my king, only better. But how many of us, with our eyes closed, you felt the Lord? Maybe he was comforting you. Maybe he was challenging you. Maybe he was encouraging you. Maybe he was trying to get your attention over here. But you felt the Lord, but because of your situation, you didn't even listen. Because of your situation, because of where you're at, because all you see and all you can think about is this right here. And because of that, you walked right by that bush. That you wouldn't even listen. And God's trying to paint you a picture. Dave, it can be that. Dan, it can be that. Dennis, look at that. He's, he's showing what it could be, what he wants to do in your life maybe. But because of your situation, because of this, the discouragement or the hopelessness, it just all goes away. Friends, I believe this, like these other points, there's too many of us that focus on our present, and this is all we see instead of what it can be. And this morning what I want to do is I want to wrap up with four points over these next couple hours and just talk about... Man, first service, I, they were like sleeping because I said the same thing. It was crickets. And, and I didn't know. I'm like, okay, it's one of two things. Either one, the Lord is really working on you and you're just in this hardcore contemplative state, or you're, uh, you're already on the lake or something. Because when, so, when a preacher says it's going to be two more hours and you should be on 15 minutes, you ought to respond. <laughs> You'd be like, uh-uh, man. Speed it up. Four things that I want to look at, because you guys, I want you to understand something. This is not, I'm not saying you, I'm saying us, because this is me all the way in my life. There are times when all I'm looking at is the mud that I'm in, whether it's here at church, something with my job, if it's at home, whatever it is, there's times where that's all I see is this, and I forget everything else that God has for me. And so these four things, I, I think they're four things that are, are, are very applicable to try and get us up and out and going so that we're not just focusing on this, but, but moving out. The first thing that I want to talk about of these four things is to adjust your focus. To adjust your focus. I, I brought my motorcycle today. Uh, number one, because I drove it in, and it's just a good reason to bring it in. It sounds so cool. When you come in, and all of a sudden you come in from the outside, and, and it's just echoing in here. Let me show you. Because if you're sleeping, Jason, right? It's going to get loud. I have this in here for a very specific reason. How many people in here drive a motorcycle? Raise your hand if you ride a motorcycle. Okay, you get this then. When you're driving a motorcycle, um, to, in order to make a turn, like a tight turn, a lot of people do this wrong. A lot of people, what they do is when they go to make a turn, all they're looking at is what's real close to them, what's, what's tight by, because you don't want to hit a rock, you don't want to hit loose gravel, you don't want to hit a pothole, something like that. And so our focus becomes down here. However, that's the wrong way to do it. The right way to turn, and actually the safer way, the way you can turn sharper and faster, is to be looking up, is to be focusing on where you want to go. So if I want to turn over and run Carolyn over, I'm looking at Carolyn, and then I'm, I'm looking back this way by Kevin. I'm not looking down here where my tire's going to go. You're paying attention to it. You're aware of it, 
But that's not where your focus is. Your focus has to be where you want to go. So if I want to go this way, I'm looking up and I'm going that way. And you guys, in our lives, there's too many of us, our focus is only on the immediate. Instead of looking up and our focus being on where we want to go, where we want to be, the areas of our life that we want to grow in, our focus, it, it ends up being just right in this small circle here, which makes you more tippy. You're not able to do it as fast. It's not as smooth and tight of a turn. And that's our lives. Our focus our focus is only on the immediate, the present. Instead of looking up and saying, hey, that's where I want to go. You see, if I'm going through hard times, and I'm just focusing on this, as I'm looking right here, I can't see any of you. I can a little bit see Carolyn right there. But I can't see any of you. If all I do is focus on what's immediately around me, I don't see all the people that are right there willing and wanting to help. I don't look up and see the direction of where I want to go of where I want to be, of what could be out there. The Israelites, they were so caught up in, in their struggles and, and so discouraged by their situation, they didn't even listen at first to what Moses was saying. They didn't look up to see, yeah, there's a great picture of what God's going to do in our life. You guys, that's the first thing. Adjust your focus. Don't only be focused on what's right here, but look up and see what it can be. That's the first thing. The second is this. Be realistic. Be realistic. As you start making changes in life and making these adjustments, be realistic because all too often we have this false sense that it's just going to be easy. Oh, I'm going to make this change. I'm going to stop this. I'm going to start that. This is just going to be easy. But then you get down the road a short ways and you realize this is difficult. This is very difficult. And now we become discouraged and throw in the towel. A little thing that I like to challenge people with. Um, for those of you that have never smoked, done drugs, had a drinking problem, pornography, any of that kind of stuff, I'm not ripping you or anything. I, that's great. Praise God. I, seriously. But for those of you that never have and you, you tell people, come on, it's easy. Just quit. Just quit. It's smoking. It's killing you. Just quit. It's easy. I want to challenge you with something. I want to challenge you. I want you to, to just totally cut sugar out of your diet. Some of you have done that, I guess. Just, I mean, completely cut sugar out of your diet. If you do that and you start today cutting sugar out of your diet, I can guarantee you'll be calling me Wednesday and you will be cussing me out. <laughs> Two weeks and four days. It's not easy, though, is it? At first, it's not easy. And that's, that's my point with an illustration like that. You cut something like that out of your body, body, even though you know what's out there. You know it's a lot healthier. You know it's a good thing to cut out, to balance out, to quit, whatever. But at first, it's torture. Your body, with something like sugar, your body is screaming for more sugar. It's like, it's crazy how much we take in. That's the same way when we want to make adjustments in our life. We start making these changes and we expect that it's just going to be a cakewalk, but it's extremely difficult. And then we get discouraged. You guys, oftentimes it's because we don't have a realistic outlook on it. Know that as you make changes, as you adjust your focus, it's going to be difficult. Not impossible, but know that it's going to be difficult and make it something that you want to do. But be realistic about it. First thing, adjust your focus. The second, be realistic. The third thing, Renew your faith. Renew your faith. There are times when we just need to come before the Lord. Tonight's a perfect opportunity to come before the Lord, have an hour and a half to just be. There's not going to be anything going on that you're going to be distracted by. You can lay out, you can just lay on a row of chairs and just be in the presence of God if you want to. You can be kneeling the whole time. You can be standing. But it's an opportunity to ignite that fire inside of you. Oftentimes, I think we could all testify to this, and, and again, it's one of those things where if we did have those couple hours, it would be awesome to just go around the room and hear everybody's story, where everybody's been, how far they've gone, how far they've strayed, because a lot of times when we hit the difficulty, what's the first thing to go? Our relationship with God. We slowly but surely start walking away. The number of testimonies that we've heard from people that 
the gentlemen that are here from Hazelden last Sunday that we baptized, those testimonies are ringing in my head. I grew up in the church. I grew up in the church. But then this happened, and then this happened, and slowly but surely, you start drifting away. You guys, you can go to church every single Sunday and have zero relationship with God. I want to challenge you. Ignite your faith. You want to you find something new? You want to open your eyes wide? You want to smile again? You want to see hope? You want to you have encouragement? Renew your faith. Get back in the Word, man. Dig into that prayer time. Worship the Lord. Come on Wednesday nights to the small groups. Get involved, but do something to ignite that faith. Even if it's simply this. If you're at a spot where you're just like drained, empty, you got nothing left to give, I want to challenge you today. When you go home, get in your own closet, your room, wherever that is, hit your knees and just pray to God and say, God, I need you to ignite a fire in me. I need that because I know it's barely a pilot light right now and I want it to be roaring. God, ignite something inside of me because I need you. And finally, the fourth thing is this. Embrace the changes. Here's what I mean by embrace the changes. Have you guys seen uh, the... Um, anybody notice the leaves changing? Is, is it beautiful? It, it's, it's awesome. Last night I had an opportunity to be part of a wedding on a boat uh, on uh, the St. Croix in Stillwater, and I took the bike down there, and it was just a gorgeous ride. Just, just beautiful. The colors are going. We live on Green Lake, and looking across the lake, it's just beautiful. All the colors that are in the trees. It's something, isn't it? It's just amazing. Um, do you know what the leaves are doing? They're dying. The leaves are dying. You guys are sick. You find so much enjoyment in watching these things die. That's what they're doing. The leaves are dying, and look at how beautiful it is. And, and not only that, but understand what happens. So the leaves die, they change. They fall. And that tree is just still. It's in a sense, it's just resting. And then all of a sudden, springtime comes around. Springtime comes around, and this tree, because of the way it's been created, it knows, okay, it's time to change something. It starts digging deep. It digs deep, and it, and it needs nutrients. So it reaches down, and it gets this nutrients, and it sends it up, and it puts it out, all these branches. And all of a sudden, you start, de you, you start seeing these little buds that are, that are popping out all over the trees, right? And you know what's coming. What's coming is the new life. It's, it's new leaves, and it's going to be green, and everything looks fresh and beautiful again. You guys, it's exactly the same way in our lives. When we look up from what's immediately around us, all of this discouragement in our circumstances, in our situations, whatever they may be, when we're able to look up and see there's something more, well, part of that something more means I have to die to some things. I have to let some things in me go. And it can be painful. You guys, look at what the Israelites went through. When Moses and Aaron came, it's like, man, there should be trumpets playing and there should be a marching band and there should be a carnival. Why? Because they're going to get set free. But it was really hard to begin with. It's not easy, but when you think of what it can be, that dying to ourselves, it's beautiful, isn't it? The more that we do it, the more we let things go, the more we let it happen and understand, yep, this has to happen now so that that can happen in another season of my life. If I refused to let this happen. You see, if the leaves that we love to watch fall don't fall, where's the new growth going to go? That tree is just going to stay there. And that's all it will ever be. But as long as it dies, as long as those fall, there's room for growth. There's room for something new. 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, whoever is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. You guys, there are things in our lives that we need to die to, that we need to let fall. A lot of times, I don't know why it is, but a lot of times when, when I'll be watching and I'll see the wind blowing and I'll see all the leaves that the wind blows down, you know what I mean? It, it's just like, sometimes it's just like raining leaves because the wind is blowing. 
Sometimes that's exactly the way it is in our life with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes in and He blows through, He helps us just get rid of all that dead stuff. He helps us to get rid of it so that there's room for new growth. Friends, there's too many of us that sit in our churches that are, we're so focused right here. Man, we need to change our focus. We need to look up and, and look at the big peach picture. We need to be realistic. We need to understand, you know what? If we're going to get somewhere, you might have to walk through a little bit of hell to get to that next step. That's reality. You've got to be realistic about it. Be excited about renewing your faith, stirring up something inside of you and saying, God, I want to grow. God, I want to be passionate. I want you to light me on fire. I want you to clear my head, whatever that looks like for you, to renew your, fra- your, your faith and then embrace the change, whatever it is that God lays there for you. God's good, amen? amen. Some of us have some leaves that we need to let fall down. Would you guys stand and let's close in prayer.